I started of my career as a business development executive after I completed my BSc IT. In my entire tenure of journey, you know, in the corporate world, I also completed my MBA from MIT Institute. I can afford a Pizza Hut's Pizza, Pizza by the Bay. I can afford a meal once in a month in ITC. But I really cannot have a peaceful sleep because it's really a big problem. It's a big problem for all of us because at the end of the day, what matters to us is how. Shakti Verma, a resident of Asalfa Slum in Mumbai's Ghatkopar, left a job that paid him 1 lakh rupees a month to start his own business. According to him, he would have never been able to afford a proper house in Mumbai on a fixed salary. If you look at a map of Mumbai, you will find these clusters of informal settlements, officially called slums, across the city. Along with Verma, 52.5% of Mumbai's population lives in them. All of them crammed into just 9% of the city's total geographical area. The government defines slums as residential areas where dwellings are unfit for human habitation. So why does every second resident of the financial capital of the country live in them? The reason is simple, because there are no formal uh, affordable housing options in the city. So, the question is why um, does the city not produce uh, formal affordable housing? Very simply, uh, one reason, one important reason is that as long as land, the cost of land is going to factor in the cost of housing, uh, you are going to have a problem of unaffordability. And land, being scarce in Mumbai, is expensive. But others feel it is due to the government's indifference. Upon independence, India had pledged to be a socialist republic, which means the government had taken upon itself the exclusive responsibility of promoting social welfare projects, including affordable housing or social housing. Now, come 1991, the year of liberalization, the government dumps that responsibility and role and talks about facilitating the private sector. It began to depend on privatization as a means for development, undertaking development projects. Now that, to my mind, has been the major disaster leading to a state that we are now in, where housing crisis has hit the roof, where slumification of cities has begun to threaten our quality of life. Das is referring to the slum rehabilitation scheme by which private builders are roped in to construct flats for slum residents on a small portion of the slum plot, while the larger portion of the area is used to build high-end apartments. Land is at a premium in Mumbai, since the city is located on a peninsula. Over the decades, the city has grown northward, and so have the land prices. The average cost per square foot for a house in Mumbai is 21,000 rupees, whereas the average per capita income is 2.5 lakh rupees. At this rate, a 500 square foot house would cost more than a crore, a sum out of reach for the average citizen. According to a report by the National Institute of Urban Affairs, around 95% of households in Mumbai cannot afford to buy a house in the formal sector. Slum housing was one response to this problem. But living in slums can place a huge burden on families socially and financially. The residents are routinely called encroachers and illegal settlers, while others label them dirty. ये उसी कहानी की तरह है जो श्रीश पटेल जी ने जो अर्बन प्लानर हैं अपने आर्टिकल में ये कहानी का उल्लेख करा था उन्होंने बोला था कि ये ये इस तरीके से ही है कि एक बड़ी सी शिप पर बहुत सारे वर्कर्स हैं जो शिप को सफाई करते हैं उसके अंदर तरह तरह के काम करते हैं तो उसका कैप्टन करता है कि आप दिन भर यहाँ काम करो हम आपको काम का दाम भी देंगे हम आपको काम का पैसा भी देंगे पर रहने की सुविधा हम आपको यहाँ नहीं दे सकते आप दरिया के अंदर समुद्र के अंदर रहो कैसे भी करके आप अपनी रात गुजारो अगर आप शार्क मछली के खाने बनने से बच जाते हो तो सुबह को टाइम पर आठ बजे आ जाओ और नहीं आते हो तो बहुत सारे लोग लाइन में हैं क्योंकि बहुत सारे लोग आपसे भी कम पैसों में काम करने के लिए तैयार हैं बॉम्बे की कहानी भी इसी तरीके से कि यहाँ पर हम दिन भर लोगों से मेहनत करवाते हैं उनकी सर्विसेज लेते हैं पर जब वो अपनी घर की डिमांड करते हैं तो उनको हम एनकोचर्स का एनकोचमेंट का एक तमगा दे देते हैं
Their homes may be less expensive, but they end up paying a lot more for water and basic amenities. Sanitation is virtually non-existent, which can result in a wide variety of illnesses. Take Sanjay Nagar on the eastern edge of Mumbai, a broken wall separating it from the Devnar garbage dumping ground. Families live here seven members to a room. The open drains were covered only three years back, but they keep overflowing into the residents' homes. One would be tempted to think that the proliferation of slums is due to a shortage in housing. But in fact, Mumbai has the highest number of vacant houses in the country. According to the 2017 and 18 economic survey, around 5 lakh houses are vacant in Mumbai. What explains this paradox? In more recent years, I think one of the facets that we have to look for is that Mumbai is no longer only a housing market, it is an investment market. And which is why even though there has been very little buying in uh, within the housing market for the last three years, you still see that there is hardly any dip in the prices. In 2015, NRI's invested 34,200 crore rupees in real estate in India. Houses bought for investment purposes mostly remain unoccupied. But there's another reason why lakhs of houses in Mumbai are kept empty on purpose. The Bombay Rent Control Act of 1947, which became the Maharashtra Rent Control Act of 1999. The Act covers 23 lakh buildings in Mumbai, where the rents have been frozen at the pre-1965 levels. This gives landlords little incentive to rent out flats in the old buildings. Experts believe, however, that even with the scarcity of land, there is enough real estate in Mumbai to build sufficient formal housing units. Instead of commercial projects, instead of high-cost housing projects on slum land, which is cleared after rehousing them on 20%, we, if there was a restriction to those areas, let's say we build only 300 square feet to 800 square feet houses on them, then we've done a, a report which shows that after rehabilitating the existing slum dwellers, we are able to produce or construct 400,000 surplus affordable housing just through the slums redevelopment schemes. On the other hand, we've done a physical planning of over 2,000 hectares of Mahada land in Mumbai city. And we find after rehabilitating the existing tenements who are residing on Mahada land, we are able to produce 500,000 surplus affordable housing. So if you put these two figures of 500,000 through Mahada land redevelopment and slum land redevelopment, then we produce 900,000 houses, which is the shortfall that government has identified for Mumbai city. There is reason, however, to be skeptical of the government's ability in undertaking the work. Mumbai had an annual demand for uh, housing of, of up, up to 50,000 units every year since um, 1947. However, uh, all of the formal housing put together, whether it is uh, public housing or uh, privately uh, built housing, uh, the uh, output was not um, beyond you know, 20,000 units a year. So if both the government and the private players have been unable to provide adequate housing for the poor, is there any other way? Public housing is not a panacea. It's not going to produce housing for, for all. Um, privately developed housing is not going to produce housing for all. They, if you look at the amount of housing units that have been constructed by private developers over the past 10, 15, 20 years, and if you project that for the future, you'll find that they are not going to be able to produce uh, enough affordable housing over the next 100, 120 years, right? Which means that the only real viable mode of housing and effective uh, and tried and tested 
uh, method of producing affordable housing in the city is self-building. So uh, really the focus, the policy focus should be on uh, upgrading and improving informal settlements and providing service land to people to build their own homes. And what stops the government from doing that? They are doing that because if you regularize slums, um, private developers will not be able to um, you know, build flats on them and sell them in the market. It's as simple as that. On the other hand, what about fears that regularizing slums might encourage an influx of people into the cities just so they can get free houses? The idea that if you have a good housing policy, you know, it will encourage people to migrate is completely um, you know, muddle-headed because people don't come into a city because there is housing available. People come into the city because there is a possibility of a better life, the possibility of employment, there are opportunities that the city offers. That, that is the reason why people migrate into the city. By the turn of the 20th century, Bombay had become one of the largest cities in the world. But the city lacked a proper drainage system, which led to an outbreak of bubonic plague in 1896. The Bombay Improvement Trust, set up in 1898 to create sanitary housing for the urban poor, demolished more houses than it could build. And so the poor went back to living around the edges of the chawls built by the trust in what would now be called slums. In the 1920s, the Scottish urban planner Patrick Geddes visited the BIT chawls and remarked, Bombay is not housing its workers, it is warehousing them. A hundred years later, not much has changed, with the slum rehabilitation scheme threatening to do the same. In the next episode, we delve into how the scheme became a goldmine for builders and politicians while creating more pockets of informal housing in Mumbai.